Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. I have with me today, Brad Jared, and I'm really excited to have this particular conversation off air. I was learning a little bit about him and his story. He is the founder or co-founder of EmpowerMen.co. He's a certified money coach, and the mission is to help everyday men achieve and afford optimal health. Brad, really great to have you here. Jay, thanks so much. And you nailed that intro. You nailed (laughs) it. (laughs) That's awesome. Love it. So walk us through, you were sharing with me that you had, I think what I would say is more of an average beginning and that kind of led you to this path of personal development. Would love to hear your story. And mainly because I think that this example you're providing is the common case for most fathers out there, for most feel-good fathers. So love to hear your story. Sure. So I I grew up, actually, I I moved to the U.S. from South Africa when I was four. So I was an only child of immigrant parents, but I was also an immigrant myself. And we moved to Tampa, Florida from South Africa. And I had the accent. I did not dress like the other kids. I had no idea what was going on. And so I felt very lonely, very young, especially with parents that were in their late 30s when I was just four, five, six years old. And so For me, it was all about what can I do to fit in? How do I acclimate myself to my peers? Because you see how the kid that gets bullied is treated and and looked upon. And you're like, wow, that kid dresses this way. He acts this way. I do not want to sit at that lunch table. And then you see on the other side, wow, that table, everyone has the Abercrombie clothes or, you know, the Ralph Lauren clothes. They're all laughing. They're all fit. They all look cool and they're treated in a different way. And so from a very young age, I knew that. I had to do what it took to at least avoid that one table where the the nerdy kids or the kids that were more tended to be bullied were sitting at. And so the one thing I could do is I could take care of my body. And as a kid, I loved food. I still love food. Uh, I brownies, Dr. Pepper, all that stuff. That was literally what I had my entire childhood just because my mom loved to feed me and food was my, I guess, attachment. It was how I dealt with loneliness. And so I knew that, okay, if I could overcome this love for food and at least lose weight and look like some of the kids at this table, then my life would probably be better. And so that was the biggest battle as a kid was, hey, I'm chubby. I love food. I'm around food all the time. And my mom loves feeding it to me. And yet, how do I lose weight and and get this goal that I want even greater? And so it was actually in middle school that I started losing weight and really into high school, I lost more weight. I also shot up and, you know, I'm six, three, so that helped. But I remember my very first diet was four bowls of cereal a day because I thought it was only 150 calories per bowl, not really understanding how to read serving sizes, but it technically worked. I, I lost weight and I started to feel more confident. And that's when everything kind of snowballed where I realized, Hey, I, I'm in control of certain elements of my life. If, if I could overcome this, maybe I could learn to be more social. Maybe I could talk to girls. Maybe I could understand how to, to do my hair and what clothes to buy. And so that was the, the young years, the early years. And then later on at the end of my time at college at USF in Tampa, I was actually scouted by a model agent who worked at a talent agency in Tampa. And she said, hey, I think you could do some work for our agency, maybe book the occasional job. And more than anything, for me, that was just the ultimate validation. It was like, whoa, this shy, overweight kid that was just trying to fit in was being scouted, not applying, but being scouted at a nightclub to potentially model. And so that took me down the path of, hey, I see my parents come home every day. They look miserable. I know when that key hits the the doorknob at 525, 530 every evening that they're going to walk in very sluggishly. They're going to you know, be like, oh, hey, Brad, how was your day? You know, kind of just this, this uh, disdain for what they're doing. And obviously this, you know, as a kid, you're, you're, you're picking up that they're just doing this to pay the bills. There's no enjoyment. There's no passion. And I said, well, I want the exact opposite of that. And so that's when I pursued modeling. And then it led down to... Uh, led to financial coaching where I would help fellow models and actors with their money because they were better looking than me, more ripped. They got all the work, but I was able to help them there. And so everything has just led up to now where now we combine the health and the physical side because we realize there's a strong correlation and and a strong need. 
we we jumped from the the physical side, the optimizing your health, the getting the external validation very quickly into the financial coaching. Can you walk us through how how did that happen? Like what there there's a there's a part of your story that we're missing here. So where did this financial math accounting thing come from? Yeah, yeah, I, I pretty much summed up my entire life, and I got bored at that. I was like, you know, what? I gotta just, I just gotta speed up the last few years. And, you know, part of me is like reminiscing, like, yeah, I, I remember sitting at that table and thinking that. So, you know, I, I would have loved to have been one of these top male models that just, you know, was smart enough to save the money and to invest in real estate at a young age and know that, hey. I, if I can get paid a lot of money to do something that's exciting and fun and provides all this novelty and then use that money wisely, that would be great. But I never worked that much. I was never this full-time model. I was never on the, the covers of all these magazines or on billboards or any of that. A very small percentage of models are, especially male models. But I, I always was like, you know what, maybe it'll happen. Maybe it'll happen. It never did. But I became friends with a lot of these other models that I'd meet at the agency and meet at castings. And I realized that the ones that were booking the work, most of them were not very bright in terms of their money management. And so the whole time I knew I just needed to make enough to be able to save it and roll it into real estate, roll it into these investments, because this was 2012, 2013, 2014. And these guys were booking the jobs and then buying the new car buying the Rolex, going to the club and getting bottle service. And I'm thinking, gee, I mean, we're living in Florida, you know, it, you know, just a couple miles outside of Miami or a couple hundred miles, you can buy property with 9%, 10% cap rates. You can have cash flow from these single family houses. You could be doing all this because I was studying that and they weren't. And so that's when I, I started to coach and consult some of these fellow models who were so good at their craft of just Look, being in great shape and looking amazing on camera. And I was studying the other side, which is, hey, if I got a paycheck of $5,000, I know exactly what I want to do with it that's going to propel me forward in the future. And so I started helping them there. And then that ultimately led to helping more everyday professionals. I think one of the themes that we're hearing from your, from your story and what you did was you had these goals of things that you wanted to accomplish. The first being, I want to be, I don't want to be bullied. I want to be at the cool kids table. Second being, hey, I want to address my physique and uh, look a little bit better, have a little bit more energy, have a little bit more whatever, whatever that, that was. Then it was, I'm surrounded by, uh, I call them, they're high rollers, right? High up, like quick up, quick down, like high mm -hmm. spenders, high rollers. And looking at the financial implications of what they're doing. But most of everything you're saying is, hey, I had a goal. I, I figured out how to accomplish that goal, whatever those steps were. And then I taught that. I taught that to, to the next person. Is that kind of a good good summation of, of the, the pattern? Yeah. And, and I would say that when you overcome something, when you have a goal and you overcome it, the more you overcome the more you want to share it with those that are struggling because you also mm -hmm. identify with that pain. It, it's mm -hmm. not just like I have a goal, you know, I'm going to go from 10 million to 20 million and you're, you're still living a pretty comfortable life. But instead when it's, Hey, I know what it's like to walk into school. And if I go down one path, I'm going to be bullied and the other path I might be praised and popular and you're making that decision every day. And when you're in school, that is your life, right? Aside from being at home with your, your family, school is your life. And so, yeah, a lot of it has come from just this, uh, it's, it's almost painful to have the knowledge or wisdom and to keep it in because it feels like a waste of potential, a waste of life. It's like, you know, I have this, uh, I have this good in me. I have this thing that would really help others. And I know it, it would help because I've experienced the pain of not having this wisdom. Let me share this as quickly as possible so I could at least feel good about someone else not having to go through that. When it comes to fathers, you shared this off air. You said that there's a similar path to solving for, I think the example you used was $40,000 in debt and also in getting in shape. And so I'm deeply curious about your perspective on that process, and if you could explain that to us and the uh, us, the feel good fathers and myself. Yeah. So 
since we combine health and finances, we, we're asked a lot, what, what are the parallels? And uh, I'm the finance coach of the business and my partner is the health coach. And we would go back and forth and say, well, what is it that clients get from you? What do they say? And vice versa. And, you know, there's a couple of things we realized. So what is the word that people hate the most when they want to lose weight? What's the word that people are like, no, not that. It's diet, right? Diet, like, right. Diet. Okay. Oh, not a diet. Well, what's the word that someone hates the most when they're trying to get their spending and their finances in order, right? Is budget. it budget? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you think, what is, what is a budget? A budget is a diet for your money. And what is a diet? A diet is a budget for your food. So there's similarities there because you both have con uh, constricting terms that people don't really like. But you're like, okay, so that's what people don't like. That's a similarity. How does someone not be in good financial shape? Let's just say they're making a decent income. How are people in credit card debt and are lost and all this? And then how are people 40 pounds or 50 pounds overweight? Like how, how do people get there? Obviously it's decisions every day leading to that. It's not overnight. It's you, no matter what, you can't gain 40 pounds of fat in a weekend. It's going to be time and it's going to be making a lot of small decisions that are incorrect or putting you on that path. And then also a lot of times it's just a lack of awareness of where you're at because you're not, it, I mean, a lot of it is just, I don't know how many calories, how many carbs, how much protein, how much fat, the quality of the food that I'm ingesting. And I don't know how much money's really coming in, how much money's really going out, where exactly it's going out. So this, it's a lack of awareness for most people at first, unless you're saying, oh, I know I'm having 4,000 calories a day, all this, and it's just, I need to have a thousand less, but very few people have that awareness. And then it comes down to, all right, so you have the reason why you really want to pursue this. Now it's a bunch of impl implementation. It's a lot of small habits. And it's really just starting with the smallest habit that you can build upon. Because the good thing with finances and health is that it's something that we deal with every single day until we die. Money will be spent, whether it's on us, whether we're in a hospital bed, money's going to be spent somewhere, whether it's the last food we eat. Uh, you know, health is going to affect us until the day we die. So it's one of those things where you just get clear on where you are right now. And then, okay, what is one little habit I can create to just propel me forward? And then you build on the one habit. Here's a second. Here's a third. A lot of it is just reduce this here, increase that here. And if you've read uh, Atomic Habits, have you Okay, Atomic Habits yeah. is one of our favorite books. We love that book just because it's all about implementation. And he talks about, I think his name is Dave Brailsford, the coach for the UK cycling team, where the British cycling team had won, I think, one Tour de France in 105 years, something like that. No gold medals. They were known for being quite lousy. And then all of a sudden, they bring on this coach. And instead of it being massive changes everywhere, it was all about 1% improvements in hundreds of different areas. And then all of a sudden, they're breaking world records. They're winning Tour de France. They're getting all the sponsorships. And you realize, wow, okay, that's a lot like my health and finances because we're making so many decisions every single day that affect one or the other. And that's just going to be the case until we die. What's the most common example? We'll, we'll go with uh, finance and then fitness. What's the most common? financial example that you're seeing for fathers today? Like what's the leading cause of, we'll just go with debt, right? They've got credit card debt. That's what we're talking about. What, what, what's the, the leading thing that, that fathers could be aware of? I, I'm not sure if it's different than mothers, to be honest, but I, I think the, the big thing here is to understand that the way culture is in this country, it wants you to be unhealthy and it wants you to be in debt. So you're not being pushed towards financial literacy. You're not being pushed towards financial responsibility. You're not being pushed towards a low body fat percentage. You're being pushed there. And so our environment is, in, is really it. I think our environment is by far the thing that we go, hey, this is normal. What is normal is my friend there got this car. This other friend here got this watch. This other friend went on a vacation with his wife. And there's all this pressure because you know that, well, my friend is in the same position as me. He, he makes $70,000 a year. He has a wife. He has two kids. And yet he's doing all this. Well, 
now the well, your wife is like, well, you don't buy me jewelry. You don't take me on vacation. So I, I think what's normalized is the biggest thing. Because if it was normal to exercise a lot, to eat healthy, and to avoid debt the way it is in other countries where debt is frowned upon, I bet a lot of people, fathers, mothers, would not use their credit card because it's viewed in a different way. But when it's normal to have $200,000 of student loan debt and then a couple credit cards with fifteen dollars to $30,000 of debt, and you can hide it so easily and l- look like you're living a pretty good life and, and really living quite good, except for when you have to pay, you know, th- there's not really a strong reason for a lot of men, a lot of fathers to clean it up, especially if Hey, this is my wife's happy, my kids happy, and now the debt is just getting, you know, stronger or bigger and bigger. It sounds like then it's the normalized comparison. If I was going to describe, uh, kind of consolidate everything you were saying, it's the rather than managing my house, rather than making the decision that I know is, um, well, maybe maybe that I know is a long term benefit to myself, my family, everything like that. That it's a, a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. That's the idiom, right? That we're keeping up with the Joneses. And but I, I did want to. It was kind of interesting because the common sentence of success is delayed gratification. I'm going to put in the work here, and therefore on the other side, I'm going to get my my nice reward, right? And that's when we're talking financial, and we're talking, uh, we're talking financial and fitness. It's all delayed gratification. Mm-hmm. Now. The concept I think is kind of interesting here is this like it's immediate, it's immediate, whatever the opposite of gratification is. <laughs> so now, not for granted, I'm, I'm coming up with this on the spot. So delayed gratification, the opposite is just immediate, ful- like not even fulfillment, but immediate short term satisfaction. You said the father is saying, well, they're happy, they're happy. Um, so I'm happy. Uh, is that? Uh, that doesn't, that's not really the feel good fatherhood way. That's not really, I don't really think that's true. That to me feels like it's the father just saying, Welp, at least, yeah. at least they have smiles, even though I'm putting this burden of knowing we're going the debt that our finan- my finances aren't great, that my house isn't, isn't good. I probably sacrificing my retirement, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that a, a lot of times it's just, the father saying, look, I'm tired of all these things. I can't handle another argument or complaint. If a father, especially if he's not inspired by the work he's doing, he's not surrounded by good friends or whatever, and he's going home and he's like, look, I just need peace. I just need happy kids, happy wife. I need that because I can't handle any more because I'm miserable or I'm stressed out or whatever in all these other areas, these other buckets of life are, are empty and maybe he's not healthy. Maybe he's not physically healthy. So he's not feeling as sharp mentally and not as confident emotionally. And so maybe it's like, Hey, I, I just need this part to be easy. And if this is going to make it easy, if, if racking up the debt here that could be hidden makes it so that I have a nice experience with my wife and my kids, and I don't have any hardship here, then that's the trade-off. And I, I I can't speak for myself, but I would imagine a lot of men want to walk home and just say, look, this has got to be something that's put together because I have so much other hardship and struggles at work and in these other areas of life that I can't handle another, you know, dragon to slay. I hear you. I, I, I can, I can see that being a pretty big burden, uh, that, you know, the feel good fatherhood way is to take ownership, responsibility, work on each individual piece in, the, in all the different areas of your life, that that is something that everything you're describing to me sounds like hell. <laughs> like it just sounds like a, a, a terrible situation to be in. And I, I, I really empathize with folks that are, that are living that. So the first step you said was awareness. So we've got the dad, maybe it's you, maybe we could use me, whatever happens to be. We're looking at our financial situation. We're like, oh, not sustainable, but folks are kind of happy because they have whatever. Maybe it's the roof over their head. Maybe it's the the jewelry or or whatnot. What what does the father need to pay attention to? What should he be aware of? I mean, in terms of the finances, just the whole picture. I mean, it's really just, hey, I need to know where we are right now, and I need to know where we're going, and I need to communicate that to my wife, my my partner, and say, hey, this is where we're at. I think this could be better. 
And this is how I plan on us getting there. What, what are your thoughts? And uh, I mean, that's just taking ownership. It's taking leadership and responsibility because this is typically a, a father's domain or is the finances, even though obviously it's a team effort. It's always going to be a team effort, but both partners have got to be on the same page and both have got to be aware and both have got to know how to communicate effectively because typically there is one spender, one saver. There are, uh, you know, your parents gave you a lot of gifts and and really showed their love with possessions. My parents really showed love with uh, affection and we didn't spend any money. And so there's a lot of uh, conditioning from our parents that come into play, mm. but it really is the father to say, hey, look, this is a big part of our life. This affects us long term and we got to address the situation. Just get very clear on all the money that's coming in, all the money that's going out, all the investments we have, all the liabilities we have as well. And if you need professional help, you get professional help. Fortunately, there's a lot of free content out there. There's books, there's seminars, there's podcasts, there's a lot of great free stuff. And then if you need more help, then you hire a coach or you go through a, some sort of program and you get more help. But it's really on you to to write the ship wherever it's at. Got it. Got it. And so I love that. So it's awareness. Uh, the simple, I, I think the simple model here that I've always learned is you do a network, a, a net worth calculation. So you measure all your assets, you measure all your liabilities. This can be as simple as what are the things that you own? What are the payments that you got to make? If you had the, I, I love this because I, uh, my wife's uncle was a big finance guy out of New York. He just said, okay, well, if you had to sell everything, what's it all worth? So for your cars, Kelly Blue Book, right? For your house, it's Typically, you can kind of figure out the market rate of everything that's kind of around you. So you should always have those ideas in your head so that if you did need to sell everything, you at least would know what you're aiming for in that yeah, perspective, and, right? And that, that's a good place to have an understanding of, hey, could I start over? Could we move? Could we do these things? Because if we had to sell the house, the car and everything, would we still be above water? Or, man, we bought the house at a really you know, peak time. And now the, the prices have dipped 30%. And so we're gonna have to adjust. But I mean, what, the alternative is not knowing your situation. And I think the danger of that is, eventually, you're going to be confronted with having to look at the situation, and it's going to just be worse off. So it's, it's like one of those things where why ignore it? Why put it off? when there's going to be a point where you're going to have to look at it and address it and take the right actions anyway. So just make it now before it's worse, because you probably are thinking, well, if I did this two years ago, it wouldn't be as bad. I'd be in the right direction. But if you keep delaying it now, you're just making it a, a deeper hole to climb out of. I think one of the, I, I think a little bit about how we were talking about environment. And I think when we're looking at our finances, the thing that's always so crazy to me, and I know this is on purpose, is that all of these numbers, like let's just take credit card, it's always expressed as a positive number. So for instance, like let's suppose you, I think the example was $40,000 in credit card debt. Well, whenever you open up those statements, it's not gonna be like in red with a minus next to it. It's sure. gonna say 40,000. So, and we're conditioned so much to increase the score, increase the number. And those right? points. Oh, it's those their, points, their points, man. <laughs> I got 10,000 so, points. All I have to do is spend uh, you know $100,000 or $10,000. But I mean, that's that's it. And, and if you look on Amazon, you look at these websites now, the last couple of years, the big thing has been buy now or and then pay in four installments. And we're talking about like yeah. a, a $6 toothbrush. And it's like, you know, four installments, every single product is now able to buy based on payments versus the actual product itself. So a t-shirt, a $30 t-shirt, you can now have uh, monthly payments and it's not on the credit card. It's, it's these separate uh, payment processors that you see. And of course, people are like, hey, I got a paycheck for $2,500. So $3 towards this, $8 towards this. And so now it's just, you know, again, it's it's a vicious cycle and it's just the wrong habits that are compounding. Mm. What's the, uh, outside of the awareness net worth the budgeting side, what's the next best habit to develop for finances Then we'll switch to fitness? The, the way I look at it, because I don't like the, the word budget just because most people don't like the word budget. I, I have two approaches which I like. The first is the 80-20, so Pareto's principle. When you have a big snapshot of everything, 
you realize that there are just four or five bills that are taking 80% of your income. So if your goal is to save more money, to reduce spending, to just really turn this around, you want to start there. And it might be, hey, look, uh, the the mortgage is $3,500 a month, and, and that's one of our top bills, and we can't really lower that. But if there's an extra bedroom there, well, maybe you rent it out for a couple months. Maybe you do an Airbnb, and then you realize that one decision and that one implementation will do more than all the little apps and all the other little things that you're spending your money on. So you want to just start with the big chunks because if you get your housing and your car situation and maybe uh, child care or food, just whatever that top four or five is where you see, wow, that's where the big money is going, then you could do a lot of good without too many different changes just because it'll, it'll be more impactful. The flip side is death by a thousand paper cuts, which is all the micro subscriptions, the, the $9 here, the, the $14 a month there, the $6 a month there, where it's, they're so good at flying under the radar because it's such a small amount, but it's not a small amount when it's every month. And then that $6 latte or $8 latte every day, it's eight bucks. You enjoy it. That's fine. But you got to do the math for the month right? So don't look at it as a a daily expense. Look at it like, well, $8 times 30 days, you know, that's over 200 bucks. That's a good amount of money going there. Now you have a a more clear snapshot of what that actually is versus just thinking it's a lot lower than it is. So uh, I start with the big chunks, look to take one or two actions there that'll really do the most good. And then I look at the all the small stuff and then start to consolidate eliminate and a lot of these memberships what's funny is that people like ah but i use that from time to time cancel it the next time you want to use it you can you can bring it back you can uh, you know go back to the 30 day month month to month subscription but a lot of times when you leave you'll get an email a week later saying oh you know why did you leave was it too expensive and then it'll actually give you like some sort of bonus it'll say well here's 30 percent off 40 percent off to get your uh your subscription back so there's no harm in just cutting these memberships and these micro subscriptions because they'll always want to get your business back but it's a good way to test to see is it really worth the 14 dollars a month the 20 dollars a month or is it something that you can go without or at least go without for a couple months love it what is the let's talk about fitness <laughs> so uh the and the reason being right the on average in the united states we're we're overweight uh and that's like i liked your example here of body fat percentage i think that's a relatively not well understood metric because i think we know that bmi isn't a great indicator it's an indicator mm-hmm. uh how do you measure fitness I mean, to me, it's the amount of energy I have. It's my biological age versus my chronological age. It's how good I feel mentally and emotionally. Uh, You know, obviously, I want to look good. It's it's nice. It's nice looking in the mirror and be like, hey, this guy is strong. He could defend his family. He could pick up his wife. He could do these things. And and also, I want to look like someone who my kids, you know, for one, I'm not a father yet. I'm looking forward to being a father. But I, I think about this a lot. Would I look up to me if I had, if I was a kid? And so what, how would I stand? How would I look? Would I have muscle? Would I just be, you know, a lovable, overweight dad? But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't look up to my father in this realm. I'd have to look up to him in his personality and his love and his character, but not necessarily in his health. So I, I think about all those things and combine it. But it's also, it has to be sustainable because again, you know, there's no point of, uh, being in incredible shape and having a six pack and all this, but now your career suffering because you're at the gym so much. And now you're not around your kids because you're always doing this stuff. So it has to be something that's incorporating into your lifestyle and that you can sustain long term. And so, um, the, the good part about it is that the way I look at helping the, the fathers that work with us is they're really busy. So they're like, I, I can't dedicate too much time, but it takes the same amount of time to eat. I, you know, eat a salad as it does to eat a, you know, bowl of French fries. So there's, there's not really uh, a, a trade off there in terms of time, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where 
health is just it's mental, emotional, it's physical, and I would say it's spiritual as well. And so if you're feeling like, hey, I'm I feel better now at my age than when I did when I was in my earlier years, my twenties, I think you're on a good pace. Got it. Uh, I, I thought that the the replacement strategy was pretty good. That was like the salad versus the French fries element, like that. Uh, one of the big transformations that I had when I went to more cleaner foods was I stopped enjoying the the flavors in the uh, the greasy foods. So I noticed that you know, like like spinach doesn't have a great flavor, but I started to enjoy the bitterness. I started to enjoy. Mm that because i knew that oh this is like my body's rewarding me for this but i my body had to start not looking for the fats not looking for the salts not looking for the other more common additives as i was switching over my diet i I pretty much now i'm all like try to do like uh, i think you mentioned like pasture raised eggs and all organics and stuff like that as i'm fixing my body and and on my fitness journey uh so that's that's kind of like i'd love to hear your reaction well, so actually, that's a great point because if you're needing to start your health journey and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to sacrifice so much, it's it's very temporary because you're right. Someone like I, I enjoy my afternoon smoothie. I have a green smoothie every single day to break my fast around 2 33 p.m. And I love it. And my body feels it. It's, it's, you know, it hasn't eaten since about 9 p.m., 8 p.m. the day before, and it's loaded with nutrients and minerals, and there's a banana in there for sweetness and all this, and I have my protein, and I have it. I'm like, oh, that's so good. But what's crazy is I enjoy this very healthy green smoothie the same amount as someone else is enjoying a Pizza Hut uh, deep dish pizza. And and it, one is fueling me and making me feel better. The other one is deteriorating someone's health, and the enjoyment's the exact same. So that's a great point because I've, I forgot what it was like going through my health journey over 20 years ago and having that, you know, that feeling of, oh, I'm just going to give up one of my biggest joys in life, my biggest stress relief in life. And it's not the case at all. I'm enjoying like a bowl of oatmeal with almond butter is insane to me. That's like the most delicious thing in the world. And before it had to be fried chicken dipped in ranch dressing with you know some ketchup there and some hot sauce as well and now the good thing too is when you go that healthy route just try having some fried chicken and all that you're going to feel horrible so your body actually says hey we want to keep you on this pace so again once you make that jump just like with the the financial side when you make that jump and you in, you see your bank account go up you get addicted to the saving. There's a point where a lot of people are like, oh man, this is amazing. Like I'm growing my net worth and you become almost uh, obsessed with the reverse instead of accumulating all this stuff. Now you're getting obsessed with the progress in this other direction. So I, I would say that's one big aspect is just understanding you, you perceive it to be a lot tougher than it is thinking that it'll always be that way. I'll always be missing this food. I'll always that. But then there's a point where your body says, if you touch that, we're going to be laying down and, and your stomach's going to be making all sorts of noises and you're going to be feeling horrible. And then it becomes a lot easier. And then you're going to start craving the foods that make you feel good. So um, yeah, great point. One of the, I think one of the biggest contributing factors, and you mentioned earlier was environment. So who you're surrounded with. As you're on these journeys, there's going to be, let's suppose we're talking with fathers, let's suppose your, your spouse, your spouse or partner, not the most supportive in this environment. How do you help them have that, that conversation? That's a tough one because, you know, I, I would hope your partner wants you to be the best version of yourself and vice versa. And I, I, I'd have a very serious discussion with my partner if that were not the case because I, I can't imagine being with someone who's like, no, 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 I'm used to you being this way and this is the the person I love and you can't now do better and and expect me to stick around. So honestly, that's that's one that maybe therapy would have to uh, come into play because that's beyond my, my expertise. But I think coming from a place of, hey, I wanna be here for our kids and I wanna be here for you and I wanna be the best version of myself for all of us. And I want to be the best provider, the best protector, the best role model. And so in order for me to do that, I've got to take care of my health. I got to take care of my finances. I got to go down this journey and I really need you to support me on it. And the ways you can support me are when I'm, 
you know, about to break, if I'm about to do something, I want you to please hold me accountable. Uh, instead of tempting me with your delicious lasagna that you make every Wednesday, can you please make this healthier version or can we try this 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 week? And I, I think a lot of it is just understanding where they're coming from and understanding that this is this might be a bit difficult or it might bring up some insecurities for themselves, for, for, the, for your partner, if they're not working on themselves or it's putting pressure on them to lose weight or to start looking at their health or finances in a better way. But I think communicating, hey, I just got to do this for me. This is going to make me feel a lot more confident. The last thing I would want is to harbor any resentment towards you for not supporting me on something that's so important. And when I was a kid, you know, and, and I'm serious about losing weight. My mom was that. I didn't have the the partner, obviously. I'm 12 years old, but my mom was the one that was coming up to my room with brownies and Dr. Pepper when I said, no, 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 please don't. And I remember I still harbor some resentment because I'm like, hey, that was not cool. I, I had to overcome this person who was my, uh, pro, who's providing for me, who's the, the chef, who's the one that's provides all the food. I have to overcome you for this goal that I really want. And it made it so much tougher. So you definitely don't want to be that for your partner. And if you communicate it accurately and honestly, I, I think most partners would understand and would, would respect you for it as well. I love the, the, there's an implicit story that I thought you were kind of pointing at when it comes to uh, your spouse partner arrangement and your kids and your family and stuff like that. It's the the parable of uh, the the daughter one day is looking at mom who's preparing a a ham roll or something like that, and they and they cut off the ends. They cut off the ends before they put it into the dish, and and the daughter's like, "That dish was big enough for the ends. Why did you cut the ends off?" It's like, "Oh well, this is the way that my mom my mom did it." So then they call up call up the mom's mom and just you know call up grandma. Hey, why why did you know uh, you know mom was saying that you cut off the ends? of the of the roll and before you put it into the the baking pan and put that in the oven oh well i learned it from from my from my mom and then okay so then they call great grandma right so then so they get, get great grandma on the phone and hey what you know grandma was saying you know daughter's like hey grandma was saying that you cut the the ends off the log roll uh why why did you do that didn't she learn it from you she said well because my baking pan wasn't big enough <laughs> so so we sometimes we're, we're not even aware, you know, I was thinking about the the brownies and Dr. Peppers, like we're not even aware of, I think, some of the habits that we've inherited. Um, and I think that especially for us in our generation, at some point in our line, there is uh, there's a group of people that grew up in the Great Depression. And in the Great Depression, I remember hearing the stories that if you had, when somebody came over, you would give them food. Because it was so hard for so many people. I'm, I'm not even aware of the, the core statistics, but I think it was like 25% people on employment, stuff like that. This, this These numbers could be all nonsense. I'm usually much better at understanding this. But I just remember hearing the stories of you would offer them a sandwich, you would offer them food. And so the food and the feeding during that time of, of lack was was the big piece of hospitality, was the big piece of stuff. And so that just kind of became habit. And so we've cut off the ends of our rolls into the bread pan and we don't even know why anymore. So that's... uh. I think that was, um, and that's something very interesting to get into, I believe. Well, yeah. And knowing my mom, Jewish mom, you know, she loved me. She spoiled me. And for her cooking for me and giving me food was her fulfillment. It, you know, she didn't see me as getting fat. She saw me as a growing boy. I remember her saying, he's a growing boy. He needs food. Now, Dr. Peppers and brownies are not necessarily food, but as a kid, you got certain taste buds and you're like, hey. Uh, give me the Dr. Pepper, give me the brownies. But, you know, again, for, for adults, for a partnership dynamic, maybe your spouse loves cooking for you. Maybe she loves doing this or he loves doing this. And that that requires, hey, I love the fact that you cook for me. I love the fact that you're cooking these recipes that you've uh, adopted since from your mother, your grandmother. I appreciate all that. Here's where I stand and here's my goals. Let's see if there's a way that you can still feel that same level of joy and fulfillment providing me a warm, delicious meal that also serves my goal. Because if not, then we're going to have this little battle of you not feeling fulfilled with what you're doing and me feeling a bit of resentment that you're making it tougher for me to accomplish this goal, which is actually for the benefit of the entire family. So how do you do that? I 
I don't know any other way, but just honest communication, have great self-awareness with it, have a great humility and say, this is why it's important. This is how I see it benefiting all of us. Tell me why this is very important to you. And then just sitting and being very, uh, I guess, uh, aware and just being a great listener and then just trying to put yourself in her shoes or his shoes as to uh, why this menial thing to you is so important to them. Wise perspective, you know, build it together, uh, enroll people in your vision and what you're building. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Brad, we can, uh, there'll be links down in the description. You can find, find him if you want to work with him at uh, empowermen.co. Again, links down below uh, in that description. Uh, thanks so much, Brad. Jay, this was a true pleasure. Thanks so, so much for having me.